Alright oh guys, Hatchcraft back again today. Hope you're all doing good and enjoying your day so far. Absolute chaos in the CDL last night as it seems after a disastrous season, the executives at the Boston Breach have decided enough is enough. They're going to nuke their entire organization, similar to what it seems happened with Los Angeles Grillers over the last couple of years with Stan Kroenke. Now it seems Robert Kraft's executive team is doing exactly the same thing. Loads of drama about this because who knows what this means for next season of the CDL? Who's going to come in instead? What happens for the World Cup? Is it true that these players are getting locked out of their apartments as of today with one day of notice. Is it even legal? What's going on? Very much intrigued to your thoughts in the comments below. Hit the like button if you enjoy. Subscribe if you're new as always. We're going to go through everything today in as much detail as we have and understanding at the moment. And no time to waste. We're going to dive right in because this was obviously the big story of yesterday and is a crazy day in the Call of Duty League again. It does also make me wonder, when the league came around, the whole point was to reach out to these big sports owners to get them to have an esports team with the intention they would be long-standing franchise is with no problems and no drama that we used to have pre-CDL. Let's not forget, even in Black Ops 4, we had organizations like Midnight Esports and Red Reserve and Denial, like Denial Esports, right? Questionable organizations with questionable integrity. And the whole point was of the CDL to get rid of that in some sense. And sure, on some level that's worked, but we're still getting cases where organizations are just blowing it up with absolutely no notice at all. So Oxton Esports, Boston Breach, they are part of the heading under, you know, Robert Kraft or whatever it is, owners of, you know, the Patriots and all this type of stuff. And apparently, as of yesterday, they're in the process of laying off all of their staff and their players and ceasing operations entirely. So um, players from the Boston Breach, this was then like the big bombshell, really. Really. So they've got this facility, like the Helix Esports facility or something like that, and it seems that the um, the organization is also paying for their apartment, which is a pretty common thing in esports. Okay, in like the NBA, I imagine, you know, they get paid so much that it doesn't matter. But in, you know, esports world, when they're not getting paid as much, often the organizations will also comp their apartments or whatever the case is. So um, apparently they were then told that they had to be out of their apartments as of today the 8th of August. Now, I don't know if this is even possible or legal, and we'll get to that in a second, but of course, they're still going to Riyadh, right? Like, Boston are still signed up to go to Saudi Arabia. I imagine the flights are booked. Obviously, their place of the tournament is set, but who are they going to represent there? I have no idea right now, And but I guess they're still going to go, but they're probably flying out of Boston, but where are they living in Boston? Because they don't have an apartment anymore. So this is chaos. And obviously Jake Hell was the one reporting this as well. And I think it's crucial to note here that a lot of the management, I suppose, have been completely blindsided by this as well. Like the management is seeking a resolution for the current situation. Seems again, this is, you know, a decision coming down from the executives and they've just decided, all right, well, this project is losing money. We're not sure when it's going to make money. Let's just cull it right now and inform everyone what's going to be happening with a very last minute, um, you know, understanding, right? And the other point is, did the players even know this was coming or are they finding out the same time we are? Because genuinely, sometimes this happens when the players and the staff don't even get told, it gets leaked publicly and that's the first that the players hear of it. So Cammy, of course, who was briefly on the Boston Academy last year, then this year he's actually going to be on Boston release. They've formed that roster, right? The Cammy Awakening Purge Snoopy roster for the Esports World Cup. That's the whole thing. And, um, well, here's Beans. And the issue is for Beans, I guess it's kind of interesting, right? Because he's now on Ravens. But, of course, he was on Boston last year. So, potentially, he's still living in Boston where that apartment was until, like, that runs to the end of its cycle. That would make a fair bit of sense. And, um, of course, here he is putting in the cussing people about not being able to get into the facility or even the potential apartments. Like, I'm imagining we're going to find more about that today. But, um, yeah, we saw a few tweets here, the likes of Awakening and even from Purge as well, kind of, like, implying that either they were aware for a very brief period of time or they were literally completely blindsided by the idea that Boston are just absolutely going to be shutting it down. And, um, you know, so so much to say on this. First of all, shout out Easy Mac as well because he lives in Boston near where the facility is and where the apartments are. And he's like, look, if you guys need any, you know, place to stay over the next couple of days, then, um, then come through, obviously. So, yeah, Austin's the man, as always. One of the best guys in the scene. Hopefully this works 
won't be necessary. Uh, but I just don't really know what the situation is right now because this is coming out of nowhere. Like, there weren't even rumors about this, right? There were rumors about organizations wanting to get involved, other esports entities looking to get into the CDL. But there weren't really any rumours that Boston were going to call it a day. I did, like, kind of run the possibility through my mind just because they've had a terrible season. They've had a terrible couple of seasons. The return on investment for Boston doesn't really seem to be there. They put a lot of money in last year, right? I mean, I don't know how much Slasher was on. I don't know how much Priester was on. But the rumour, I think, was that they wanted to pay Envoy... 400k something in that ballpark he actually said no and went to Toronto instead and ended up winning an event over there probably a wise decision in hindsight right but um it did have the feelings Boston to some extent of Los Angeles Gorilla situation right where they paid big money they gave Arsatis the absolute supermax contract after it came off phase and then within a year or so just blew it up and went down to bare minimum because they couldn't sell the spot so they had to just keep it going with 50k the thing is with Boston though They've done far more for the scene than Los Angeles Gorillas ever did. And that to me is the frustrating thing. Gorillas blowing it up and collapsing and shutting down because I think they're probably going to call it a day Gorillas this season. If they can find a buyer or whatever, that's what they're going to do. They've been planning to do it for some time. That's probably why they rejected the World Cup invitation as well. But they never did much for the scene. Boston have actually been committed to it and have been one of the better organisations we've had. The results in the server, not so good. The decision making outside of the server, not so good. But as an organization, they've done a lot of things right. And um, this is why this is just such a difficult situation. Even Gunner's kind of quotes from the article that said, the players or the team or the staff, whatever, were urged to continue to work for free, even though they'd be getting laid off. So, um, I mean, look, if that's true, it's like, what are we doing here? <laughs> Especially the way things are currently going in this like economy, right? And as Slasher says, saw that coming from a mile away. So it seems like Slasher was... He did say, to be fair, he talked a lot about Boston and his time on Boston during the season. He also did say that there was kind of more to be said on the Boston situation that he didn't want to say yet. And, um, well, maybe that'll come out in due course from Slasher with a podcast with Ace or I don't know what they're planning to do. But um, it's very interesting to hear that from Slasher's point of view that he kind of saw the writing on the wall to some degree on this, maybe while he was on that Boston team over the last few months that he was there. Obviously, see Chris as well, who's the content team over there, is, um, you know, just wishing the best for all those guys, right, because there's so many people involved in making an organisation tick as it has done, and for everyone to just get informed basically overnight that, yeah, your jobs are gone, your apartments are gone, and unlucky, that's how it's going to be. It's, um, yeah, it's just terrible. So wishing the best for all of those guys. And then the question was, well, hang on a second. How come they can get kicked out of their apartment on one day's notice? Like, even if that's in their, like, contract, surely there's something in the local state Massachusetts law that prevents you doing this. I don't really know the answer to those questions. So this is then the other question, whether the players, you know, could they get the lawyers involved or whatever, because like telling someone you're fired and now you're homeless within like a one day notice is, I don't know if that really holds up as far as I'm concerned. But um, this is just one of these decisions that has come down from the very top ends. And well, as Method says, he was on Boston for a good couple of years. To speak on my former team and organization, I can tell you with certainty that the staff and ownership group in Boston love and care for this community and their players. A Thanksgiving dinner with them when our schedule didn't permit us to go home. You know, they are hurting too, because this has seemingly come down from the top. And, um, you know, what next, right? And this is where kind of the discussion raised about the fact that these organizations in the CDL era, are they really any better than some of the dodgy orgs that we had back in the day? Because they still do stuff like this on basically no notice. I think the frustrating part is for me about this development is that, like, the Los Angeles Griller stuff was bad. But as I say, they'd never really done much for the scene grillers. They just put money in and then it was quite clear that it was going to be a bottomless pit of cash effectively. But as um, you know, Zemo says, they've built a fan base Boston. They've hosted events in Boston, good ones at that. They've, you know, tried to develop talent for the next generation. They've had academy teams. They've had a facility. And sure, the results and their numbers don't reflect the input they've necessarily given. But they've been a good organization. You know, they've been a promising organization, I think. And, um, you know, they were an organization that people, I wouldn't say were buzzing to play for, but at least they did have, you know, some positive attributes. They were seriously, you know, it seemed like they were committed. But of course, 
every org is committed until they are not. And that is now, it seems, the case. Because, as Jake Hell says, like, they gave CDL fans more in the last few years than, like, most other organizations could even start to talk about. So... It is a massive loss, I think, for the league losing Boston. There's no guarantee at all that whichever organization comes in instead, which presumably somebody will, is going to be as good or as committed as Boston are and have been over the last few years. So a couple of questions now. What happens next? Which organizations might come in instead? Because Boston apparently are shutting it down. Everyone's getting fired. I guess they're going to effectively play at the World Cup and then after that it's going to be done for those guys. So, you know, awful for the players. I mean, they've just signed a contract but, um, you know, to play for the World Cup and potentially beyond. So what does that contract look like? You know, unlucky you're not getting paid anymore. Are they getting paid to go to the World Cup? How does it work with the prize money? Because the prize money from the World Cup usually gets distributed to the organization and then down to the players. I have no idea what's next, really. But of course, we've got to see some other organizations come in. We've seen Cloud9 come in, effectively buying over the subliners. And this is kind of the point that I was saying at the time that, you know, could New York not have just stayed as they were and then Cloud9 come in and buy another spot, potentially? Because what other orgs are there out there? We know that the likes of TSM, like there are orgs interested in getting into the league. And presumably that's what's going to happen. I mean, like Boston came in, they, they bought out what was kind of like that Chicago spot when they first came into the league a good few years ago. And, you know, as uh, well, we see this, it seems like they're going to be ceasing operations after their three year run from Vanguard through to Modern Warfare 3. <laughs> this is pretty funny for Brian, I'm not going to lie. These are their highlights as an organization here. They were Scump's opponent in his final career match. So yeah, number one highlight there from Boston Bridge. Congratulations. Winning his player was Nero with 33 three series wins for the team. Methods holds the highest stage KD in CDL history with a 1.38, of course, if you guys remember that one that um, he still talks about to this day. Not that often, to be fair, but uh, still mentioned from time to time. Numerous rookie debuts as well. So, um, like, they made some poor decisions over the years, but nonetheless... It's, it's just a bad situation. So I'm sure there's going to be updates on this coming soon. But it doesn't leave the seed in a great spot. Because in some ways we effectively have 10 teams now, right? Like we had 12. We talked about, oh, could we get to 16? But maybe as we might have expected, some of the organizations that have committed serious capital, their executives are now looking at the team and saying, well, this is a pointless vertical. It's not making us any money. Basically, Bobby Kotick sold us down the river, which is absolutely true for a lot of these big sports owners. So that's why I think we're seeing some of these uh, repercussions. And it's just, it's not crazy, but it's like teams like the Paris Legion, they don't spend much money, but they're still here because they're not in a bottomless pit of cash. And they're actually even making money potentially after the YouTube deal. They're kind of that actually covers often their salaries of their players and maybe a bit more as well. So Boston certainly were losing big cash over the last few years. But now we've got to try and... We've got 10 teams, effectively. Boston are going to be gone. Gorillas, I think, are going to be gone. I mean, if Boston are literally calling it a day... Are they going to be forced to do what Gorillas did and feel the roster for literally pennies on the dollar? I hope, I really hope that's not the case because I want some actual competition in the league. Although it's not like Boston were competitive this year either. Gorillas at least found a way to make it to the World Championship. Or the more likely possibility is some other organizations will come in. Certainly with the World Cup situation as it presently stands, there are going to be other orgs that want to get involved in COD. And, um, well, with any luck, that's what we're going to see. A couple of quick things to close out the video here. Top 25 COD players of all time here from CDU Scrum Intel. Number six goes to Simp, and I think this is about right. I mean, he has Simp number six, Formal number five, and I think both of these is probably where I might put them on the list right now. In terms of, like, pure talent and everything, Simp has had the potential, even from his first ever years, to be considered, like, you know, he potentially was the player that people looked at to overtake Krim, potentially, and become the greatest ever. And look, he's played 36 events now. Like, that is a lot of events. 24 finals appearances is crazy. But the 10 wins, like, it's just the finals record, you know. If things were different, given the talent that Simp has and the amount of events he's played and the amount of finals he's reached, if the finals record was significantly better, Simp would be comfortably top five. But this is just what's holding him back. And he can turn it around, but um, it's just... Like, it's just difficult to see Simp ever being the greatest ever with the way that it looks. Even if he wins a couple more rings. It's, um, well, at that point, it's a conversation, obviously. But time will only tell on that because there's been opportunities over the last few years, but it's never quite come to fruition. But very much enjoyed your thoughts in the comments. Hit the like button if you enjoyed. Subscribe if you're new. Take care. And I'll see you next time.